I think Miss Lucia Mish needs no introduction to this audience. Let me simply say that um, we're sorry that this is the uh, last of the commencements that she'll be formally associated with. As you know, she and uh, a thousand other people are graduating tomorrow. But she tells me that there will be some summers that she'll come back and be with us. And those of you who have been with her before uh, know the treat that's in store for us today as she tells us something about classroom art as cultural enrichment. Miss me? Uh, thank you, Dean Burkhardt. And I really consider it a great privilege to be here. And it seems to me that uh, to be a part of this um, uh, seminar is, is really an, a distinct privilege. And I thank everybody for asking me, and I thank you people for being here on this hot morning. Um, I'd like to make this very informal. Uh, there's not going to be any firstly and secondly and thirdly sort of an arrangement. It's just going to be um, sort of a, an art education, shall we say, lesson, as though I were having a class. And I'm just sort of thinking out loud. Um, I feel very strongly about art education because it has been my main interest for many years, along with my weaving. And uh, this last um, month, I was in New York and heard uh, this conference at the Museum of Modern Art on uh, art education, a spiritual frontier, and it strengthened some of the ideas that I had. Uh, mainly, I would say that art education to me has always seemed much more important than just simply taking some materials and making something with them. It seems to me that there should be a much, much broader of, uh, uh, feeling about the uh, field of art education. I'd like to uh, read this little story. This is by a little boy. <clears throat> Our paint boxes have just a few colors in them. That's all. Seven, that's all. Just such a few colors didn't interest me. I wanted a lot of colors. That is, not a lot of different colors, but lots of kinds of color. It's sort of hard to explain, but you can see it in a zinnia. There were some growing in our garden, and in those little petals, starting at the middle, you can see lots of shades of one color before you get to the edge of the flower. In the little tiny part that makes the center, well, it was greenish, but, and not, but light, not dark. That was the middle, like a bullseye. And then the petals start growing, and they start changing color. First thing, first there's a lemony color. <coughs> And in the next band, more yellow, and then the petals turn to a real yellow, but soft. And they seem to change a little speck all the way to the edges of the flower, where they got to be a very rosy orange. But with just my seven color box, what could I do? I thought I'd try just the same, and the first thing I knew, I had a lot of samples all over my paper, and I had lots of those zinnia colors by just mixing around with my paintbrush. I didn't, I didn't bend them myself. It was a spectrum, the teacher said, and if I'd stay in a while when we went out to recess, she'd explain that to me. That little boy was very fortunate in having a teacher who went further than just simply handing out materials, you see, to the children. She really wanted to uh, broaden them. I feel that this culture enrichment is one of the responsibilities of all teachers, and art people have a, a great deal of opportunity to do that. We have wonderful materials to work with. And when I think about culture and the meaning of culture, the sum total of the values and the beliefs of a people, of a period, it seems to me that we can do so much in um, influencing people. We can do so much in uh, helping to uh, deepen sensitivity and to um, raise values or standards of values uh, in so many ways. I've had uh, some experiences that have interested me, and you don't mind if I uh, repeat a few of these experiences. I feel that uh, some of our main opportunities, perhaps, are in these directions, art history, even in the first grade, and work with materials, <clears throat> and just, just general appreciation, talking about things. There are many ways in which we can uh, enrich culturally the children that we have with us. And if we don't uh, do it, I feel that we're missing some of our real our opportunity and our responsibility. This um, meeting in New York, Art Education as a Spiritual Frontier, 
I think it was the first morning that one of the gentlemen spoke, uh, he was from New York University, and he spoke on the building that was taking place in Brooklyn Heights. He said, that's the area where I live. And he said, it is, it is a shame what's happening up there. They're putting up these large housing developments and they're tearing down some of the fine old Georgian mansions to make room for these developments. Now, he said, uh, there it seems to be a lack of appreciation of the things that are fine and sound just to put up something new. And all the way through his talk, and this was sounded again and again throughout the meeting, that the art people really somehow have failed in their field, other people have too, and that we must take this more seriously, this developing of more sensitivity, this uh, increase in appreciation of the things that are really good, and aiming always toward having more things that are good. And so it seems to me that teachers, there are lots of ways we can do it. Um, we can talk about color, just like this little boy, in doing this little painting lesson. Um, I don't think that all art lessons need to be working with materials. I think we can just talk about things. Um, I find that little children love to line up, and you can talk about, uh, ask different children with blues on to get up, and they all stand in a row, and I'll say, now, why do you suppose you're all standing up here? Well, maybe they'll discover they all have blues on, but the blues are very different. And maybe another day it'll be uh, going to the window and maybe studying the shape and the form of a tree. There are so many ways of teaching this appreciation. Uh, it, it interests me very much how children will uh, be so sensitive to things if we call their attention to it. During their little periods in the morning, five minutes perhaps, before they start their work, if you have a few flowers, and you know how children bring these flowers, especially first and second graders, their hot little hands and their flowers are all mashed down. Margaret, you know, don't you? And uh, they're, they're, they're just held until they're just wilted. Well, then you, of course, are very busy, and you stick them down into a fruit jar and uh, hope uh, that they will revive. Uh, sometimes you get so busy that the uh, jars stand there for days, and they don't revive, but uh, often these flowers are quite beautiful, and you can use them for uh, little lessons. And I found that it was rather interesting to take little bowls and, and uh, containers of different materials and different shapes and in those five minute peri discussion periods, we'd have some of these little appreciation lessons. We talk about the flowers and the kind of containers that are appropriate for flowers. That a zinnia doesn't go into a glass uh, container. A zinnia is better in a pottery bowl or a copper bowl because of its uh, woody, stiff, uh, bristly stem. That cosmos uh, probably might be better in a crystal bowl and that kind of thing. We talk about the types of containers, the height of the flowers with the containers, and <clears throat> maybe the color of the paper you use under the bowl, and even first graders, many of them catch that. So we use uh, discussions. We use field trips. I think there's a, a fascinating book that I, I love to talk about. I love uh, to read the book. It's by Tamima Ghazari, and she calls it Footprints and New Worlds. And she speaks about this one day when uh, things were rather dull and said to the children, shall we take a walk? Well, of course, you know, the children love to take a walk and they went out and having this wonderful walk. And then she said, um, now just stop where you are and make a line around your foot. And they did, they took a little twig and made a little line, an outline around the foot. She said, now study everything in that footprint, everything that you see. Some of them were standing on concrete, some were standing on grass, some were standing on a kind of a bare spot. They studied the grasses, they studied the pebbles, and then they went back to the classroom and talked about those things. And she told them about grasses, that there's not one blade of grass in the world like another one. And she talked about the grass, how it would look to the little ants that some of them had seen. It would be just like a jungle. And then she said, all right, after quite a discussion, uh, why don't we just make pictures of the things we saw in our footprints? And she said she had a very exciting group of pictures. Well, we have so many fine books of that kind that uh, help us. Uh, to um, and inspire us to do this kind of work so whether we don't stop with just our art materials because I don't think that we do go very far in enriching children culturally if we just give them crayon and say now draw what you want to it, it seems to me that it has to go much much deeper than that <clears throat> now some people question whether art history can be done with children uh, certainly with little first and second and third graders but I think it can, 
And I think to uh, help children in their cultural development that they need to learn not only something about their own period and their own people, but they need to know about the past. And I have had even college people say, well, why are we studying about these things of the past? Because why do we worship the past, she said, when we have all this fine of today? I don't think we can fully appreciate today if we don't understand the past. In the first place, I think it's a fine thing for everyone to have a respect for things of the past. I think one of the, one of the things about culture is a, an ability to respect our things no matter what it is. <clears throat> so this uh, respecting the past, I think, is something that we, ought, we need to teach our children, and certainly we can with the help of books uh, in many, many ways. So in uh, various ways, I have found little things that I've been able to use in my teaching. And one day I discovered a story that, to me, was quite a treasure. It was quite by accident that I found it. It seems that back in just before the First World War, there was a young man, a young boy, in southern France who loved to climb mountains. And nothing made him feel better than to get way up high and look out over the countryside, way down. One day there was a terrific storm that came up and he took refuge in a cave. And he always carried a candle with him and he lit this candle and put it up on the wall of the cave. And as he looked around, <coughs> he, was, he became very interested in the beautiful rock formations and made up his mind then and there that from then on he would um, study caves and grottos instead of just climbing. So when he came down and he went, went around among the people, he asked the shepherds, did they know anything about some caves that he could explore? They said no, they didn't know anything about a cave, but there was a, a peculiar hole in the hill where they grazed their sheep. It was a very low hill, it wasn't steep, but they said this, this hole was there and they let brambles grow up around it because the sheep would fall into it. And they said another thing that's very strange, down at the bottom where this hill levels out completely into the valley, there suddenly is a stream of water. No one knew where it came from. There didn't seem to be a spring. Well, this Norbert Castoret knew that there was some a possibility there might be an underground stream. And so the next day he went up this hill and he let himself down in this hole, in this hill. And yeah, we can make that very dramatic, you know, he let himself down in this hole, in this black hole, it was ink, inky black, and sure enough, his feet did strike pebbles and water. Uh, it was a stream, and sometimes the ceiling was so low that he had to, he had to bend over to walk. And sometimes he had to walk in the water in order to walk at all. The ceiling was so low. Well, finally, uh, the ceiling dipped right down into the water. And most people would have said, well, of course, you cannot go through rock, so I'll just have to give it up as far as I can go. But he didn't. As he looked at this rock, something told him that perhaps it was a siphon. And if he would dive under the siphon, uh, under this rock, he would get out on the other side. And that's exactly what he did. But when he got out on the other side, he knew if he didn't turn right around and go back, that he would lose his sense of direction because it was inky black, of course, inky dark. And he, he came back and there was his little candle burning on the other side and he was quite excited. So th he went out that day and the next day came back with a whole uh, bathing cap full of candles and matches. And so that day when he took this little dive under the rock, <clears throat> he lit candles on the other side and he found he was in a large hall a large rocky hall. The stream went on and there were boulders all over the ground and um, it was very, he was very cold. He'd been down in this water and it was very cold down in this place and uh, he had to uh, take some violent exercises in order to warm up sufficiently so he could go on. And it got wilder and wilder. The rocks were tossed around in a very wild manner as though some giant had tossed them down and said, well, all right, you made the first hazard but you'll never make this next one because here was another great jumble of huge boulders but he found his way, found a little passage between them and got through on, on the other side. And again, he wandered along for some time. Then finally, there was another place where the uh, ceiling came down and it was even worse than the first one, but he made that one too. And when he came out, he did find a, a very large room. And it seemed as though the stream went in one direction and there was a narrow a, and a dry passage in another direction. 
Well, that was the kind of thing that he was hoping he might find. Well, he was interested in finding out where that water came from, that stream began, so he followed the wet passage. And he did find then finally a place where it was, it was even more wild than the other uh, trip had been. But he finally came to the place where the, the rock came down into the water again and he had to just feel with his arm in some of the holes between the rocks and he found that he was feeling little tadpoles. So he knew he was very near uh, air and very near the surface. This was then there was the beginning of the stream and he was satisfied. And he thought, now the next thing I want to do, I want to take that dry passage came up that day, and the very next day the rains began, the September rains began, and he was not able then, you see this whole passageway filled with water, and he couldn't uh, take it again. Well, the, for the war broke out, and for four years he was in the war, and he kept wondering, would he ever get out and go back and be able to find what happened in that cave or in this underground passage? But he, he was fortunate, he got out, and then his brother and a friend went with him, and the three boys went down, and this time they followed the dry passage and they found just what he had hoped to find at the end of this great, large, long passage. There was a tremendous big hall. The walls were caked with dry mud, and when they chipped this off, they found these wonderful drawings in rock by people perhaps of 30,000 years before Christ. The discovery of the oldest art in the world, the oldest pictures in the world, now, that story, of course, you see, is a story that you can tell people in the first grade, uh, in the fifth grade, in the eighth grade, and even adult people seem to be fairly interested in it. And um, it, is, uh, it is authentic, it is real. The Mr. Norbert Castaway is still living. He's a member of the National Geographic Society uh, now. And uh, he is um, a person who has been honored. I think they have made a movie of, of some of the explorations down in this cave. Now, of course, the thing that they were finding was these drawings by these early, early people, animals, these huge elephants and so forth. Uh, the early peoples did not make many people. They were, they were very crudely done. But these early peoples could do animals very well. Beautiful expressive line because they had to know animals in order to, to be able to uh, defend themselves against them, in order to get them, to uh, kill them for their food. And so these, the drawings were very fine. Uh, this is in the Pyrenees Mountains in southern France. I just accidentally found this story in the National Geographic of August 1924. And it has fascinated me and has fascinated hundreds of people. That is an art history lesson. And it's the kind of thing that children, and if you make it a little dramatic and make some sketches on the board, you know, and everything with it, uh, really uh, is very impressive for children and it makes an, uh, an impression on them so they remember it. Then we have some perfectly beautiful books. Uh, Giotto Tended the Sheep is one that I have used uh, many times. It's uh, written uh, not on white paper, but on a soft salmon color paper. Giotto, of course, this Italian artist, and the story of his work, and uh, especially the, the boyhood of Giotto fascinates the children. I have read the whole book to children when they were doing lessons, like in watercolor, when everybody was painting. They were all painting just freely, whatever they wanted to paint. But I would say, all right, do you want me to read to you? And I would stand where they could all hear me, and I would read them this book. And if I would forget the book, they'd say, well, aren't you going to read to us today? They wanted to hear about Giotto, this little shepherd boy who, while he was taking care of his sheep, would chip on stone. And he was making this beautiful sheep when a man richly attired came by on horseback and stopped and watched him. And he said, where did you learn to chip like that, to carve like that? And he said, oh, I just do it just to entertain myself, to pass the time away. And this man said to him, would you like to come and work in my bottega in Florence? Well, Florence was 14 miles away from where this boy lived. He said, oh, my parents would never let me go so far away from home. And so he said, I will, I will go with you to your home and to talk to your parents. Well, of course, that was Cimabue, and Cimabue was the, the great artist of that period, 13th century, and Giotto became even greater than Cimabue, and of course, the children love that, you know, that, they, that he became greater than the teacher. So I've had some of them say uh, to me, um, well, this was an eighth grade student who said to me one day, we were, we were having little quiz periods at the end of the lesson. After we get cleaned up, we'd have five minutes. And I'd say, you may ask any question about art you wish, about things we've been doing or things that you know about art, anything. And you can call on the person you'd like to have answer this. So they'd ask questions about color and 
they'd ask who's the greatest architect in the world, and it was Frank Lloyd Wright, and all these various things. What do we mean by this kind of color and that kind of color, and so forth? And so this one boy came to me before class, and he said, say, who was that? What was the name of that artist you read to us about? He got to be better than his teacher, you know, see? <laughs> and so I said, oh, you mean Giotto, yes. And not too long ago, I think it was last summer, a girl who is now in high school reminded me of that story. And so I think these things do make an impression, uh, these stories that you read to, uh, and they, that's real, very authentic material. There are many ways of giving uh, art history uh, to little children. Uh, that, I think, helps them in developing a, piece, um, a respect for the past, and because of the respect for the past, they, uh, we hope, will have more respect of today. And it seems to me that in developing their appreciation and their respect, we have, certainly we have hope that we will have higher standards then. They will have higher ideals. They'll become more sensitive to the things so that they can, in the future, the things of the future will be uh, better in design, certainly better functionally than the things of the past. Uh, these um, little side learnings, I call them, I, we can work in in so many different ways. I suggested uh, this little quiz period, and it seems to help to uh, review things in the children's minds. They like the idea of asking their own questions and uh, calling on the person to answer the question. But in order to have uh, questions, I have to give them something. And so I will, in some uh, different ways, throw out some fact, some bit of knowledge uh, that they can use then in the questions. One day we had been doing lettering. And of course we don't letter just out of the blue. Uh, there's always a reason for any one of these things. It has to be something that seems to be tied up with their interests. And so we were lettering the names of the basketball boys. And they loved that because they could take that home and put it on the wall of their room and the schedule of the games. They were lettering. And just before I went out of the room, I said, what is the most beautiful book in the world? It's something that's related, you see, to their activity. And of course there were many hands, and they said the Bible. And I said, it is a great piece of literature, but we want the Bible to be, of course, in as many homes as possible, so, in as many places as possible, so we make it even in a cheap form. But this book I'm thinking of, there's only one like it. It is the most beautiful book in the world. <clears throat> And of course, no one knew, and I said, you would, there would no, be no way for you to know, and I'll just tell you the name of it, The Book of Kells. I said, if you happen to think about it, you might try to find out something. The bell rang, and I went out. And I came back the next time into that room, and I had, there were two boys waving their hands frantically, and I thought, I wonder what's happened now. Who stole what, you know? You know somebody's always stealing my crayons or something, you know, not always, but it happens sometimes. And I thought maybe there was trouble. But this one boy said, um, I found out, and you know, I couldn't think for a moment what we were supposed to find out, and I didn't dare say, you know, well, I just can't remember. And I said, oh, you did, what did you find out? And he said, I found out that the Book of Kells was written in Ireland, and it was put in this museum in the ninth century. And the other boy frantically waving his hand, he said, no, it wasn't the ninth century, it was the seventh century. Now, these were f fifth grade boys, and, um, the other boy said, I have authority for my statement. And the other one said, I do too. They were both encyclopedias. I said, well, there's something, isn't there? Something funny about this. Uh, maybe we better just go and check. And so they both went to the library and they checked and they came back to tell us that it had been written in the seventh century, but it was put in the library in Dublin in the ninth century. So they both had their centuries, you see, but there was just one little thing, a little discrepancy there, and we got it straightened out. And I'll venture to say that out of that class, there may be as many as 10 that might go to Ireland and go a little further than kissing the Barney Stone. I just think so. I think they might remember <laughs> that uh, there would be the Book of Kells and that it is the most beautiful book because it's completely handmade and parchment and uh, beautiful illumination, some of the most beautiful illumination of any uh, production in the world. And that kind of thing is uh, the kind of thing that's very easy uh, to do, to give them, and it does help them then in their, it enriches them, and it gives them uh, more of an appreciation. Uh, we um, had uh, all kinds of uh, 
subjects that we can uh, enrich their uh, material with. It seems to me when you're painting, we can use paintings and of uh, artists of the past and artists of, the, of today. If they're doing landscapes or if they're doing sports, we can always find some masterpiece that we can uh, relate to their work of today uh, to. And it seems to me that that is, is what I call enrichment. Sometimes I even call it fringe benefits. But I do think that our material, uh, I, I, in my own mind and in my own thinking, I think we should go further than just somebody giving them the material and working with it. And I believe that we have um, a, a sort of, we can have a hope that if we all work on that sort of thing, perhaps we will have maybe in the future a little bit more understanding and a little bit more, uh, a higher sense of values. Appreciation then and um, sensitivity nature you see is just full of it it's just full of it i've suggested before the design of grasses but the design of leaves you can do, teach all the design elements i think we have to be very careful that we don't get it tiresome but just a short lesson to pick up a leaf and talk about it or the colors of a flower like this boy with the colors of the zinnia you see it's natural to children this little boy was expressing it in his own words it wasn't something that was uh, given to him to say uh, it is natural for them. Sometimes it, uh, they don't express themselves because they're a little bit maybe ashamed, but it has to be there. And children are, people are different than, you know, I mean, they're, they, they have a soul. And so when people want to make realistic pictures, I'll say to them, if you want to make a real picture, why don't we just go out and take a camera? A camera can do it very well. A camera has an eye and it's, it, it just really has a brain. But there's one thing a camera doesn't have, and that is a soul. And that's why we have to make things different than a camera. Otherwise, we're just mechanical, and we are not mechanical. Just as soon as you take a brush or a crayon, any material in your hand, something is going to flow down through your arm from your soul into the production on your paper or whatever material you're working with. And so when you judge anything, when you are evaluating a piece of work, uh, to stop and, uh, with just saying, well, this isn't, uh, th th these legs aren't long enough, or these legs are too thick, that isn't right. It isn't right to mankind to do that, because a man, uh, any person, mankind, has a feeling. And so these people who were standing behind me at an exhibit in New York City looking at the picture by Kuniyoshi, the boy stealing apples, and his hand is just coming over the edge of the table, his head is enormous, and he, his eyes particularly are enormous. He's trying to see, you see. Uh, there were two women standing behind me, and I heard one of them say to the other one, now look at that, how'd that ever get in the show? I could do better than that. Those little tiny hands, and that great big head, and those great big eyes. Well, you see, they just didn't stop to think at all. Kuniyoshi was thinking about how a boy feels when he's stealing apples. He wishes he were all eyes that he could see everything around him so that nobody would see him. And he wishes his hands, which are doing the wrong, were invisible. Kuniyoshi is a marvelous draftsman and he would know how to draw as accurately as anyone, as realistically. But he is trying to bring out a mood and a thought. And children can catch that and in their own work they do that. And that's the interesting thing. A child, for instance, in the first grade may make a picture of someone swinging and the hands and arms will be very long and very strong, maybe very thick, and the legs will just be little tiny things. Maybe there won't be legs at all because the child has been told so many times perhaps, now hold on tight. So the arms and the hands are very important. But the legs, why, why make the legs? You see, why make the legs? And so uh, the children are very, very discriminating and they, they eliminate unnecessary parts. But then someone, very well meaning will come along and say now that isn't just right now let me show you how to do it so we had a little boy in the first grade who kept on making a little house and a little tree the same little house with a little porch on the front of it always with a little tree and I never will forget his name his name was Daryl and it's been many many years ago well the teacher of the, of the classroom teacher would come along and she said I don't know why Daryl keeps making that house and tree and I said well Let's just let him go and, and see if we can find out some, some way that we can get at this. Well, it went on for several months. Always, whether it's crayon or paint, house and tree, usually crayon. So one day I said to him, I don't know what made me think of this, and I said, Daryl, how did you ever learn to make such a nice house and tree? He said, my mother taught me. 
And there was the answer, you see. He wasn't making good enough house and tree, and so she said, I'll show you how to do it. And so he wanted to have, he wanted to have praise, he wanted to feel secure, and so he thought if he would always make it like that, that would be approved. And when he came to school, he wanted approval. And so he kept making that house and tree. He was afraid to go out and branch out in a new way. Uh, it took quite a while for us to break him away from that, and when he did begin to express himself, he did some very beautiful things. He was always a kind of a stolid little fellow. I remember I came into the room one day and we were all painting large papers on the floor and Darrell was making a crayon picture. And I just went past him. I said, Darrell, aren't you going to work with us today on those big painting? Don't you want to paint? He said, I want to work with a crayon. Just like that, just very stolid, you know. But he did branch away and he did some perfectly lovely things. So it is fun. It's a responsibility, yes, but it's fun, it's very exciting. There's nothing more exciting than working with the mind of a person, the mind of a child. Many years ago, I found a poem that was called uh, The Potter. And I remember the first lines were, I am a potter, my clay. <clears throat> my clay is the mind of a child. And I had the whole poem for many, many years, and then it disappeared from my notebook. I just lost it using my notebook. And I have always wondered if I couldn't get that poem again because I thought it was a very, it was beautifully expressed. Um, the mobility and the pliability, the, the, the plasticity of the whole thing. I mean, when you think that the mind is so uh, very impressionistic. So um, there are just many, many interesting things that can be done. And I, when I stop to think that uh, the uh, years of my service in the classroom are about over, it, uh, it does give you a feeling Perhaps you might have done a little more than you did, but it is exciting. Now, um, I think perhaps I'd like to give you a little time for questions, and so I'm just going to end, if I may, with this little story, also by a little boy. And he said, now you take art. It goes this way. When you take out your box of colored chalk and start working, lots of things can happen. One day I started drawing lines with dark brown chalk, just any kind of lines long lines, short lines, broken lines, curved lines. Some look rough and some look smooth. I didn't think much about it, but you know on Saturday I went hiking in the hills and then the funniest thing happened. I could see all those kinds of lines in an old dirt bank that we were climbing up. The water had run down there and there were lots of crevices and ridges just like I had drawn them with my brown chalk. Last fall we studied about erosion so I knew what it was but I never expected it might make a pattern. That was nice to see. The teacher had talked to us the other day about rhythm in line, but I didn't quite know what she meant. And there it was. The other kids didn't see it, and I didn't say a word. <coughs> Thank you.